can't hear anything. Afternoon, SMACNA chapter executives. If you're just joining us, we're going to wait for a few more participants and then we're going to get started. You are participating in the insurance claims and coverages webinar uh, that we scheduled for today with Patrick Cunningham. So we'll give everyone a few more minutes to uh, get in and then we'll get started. Hi, right, folks, we are going to go ahead and get started. Uh, my name is Julie Marnell. I'm with SMACNA National. We're happy to uh, bring this webinar to you on insurance claims and coverages, uh, managing your risk. I want to just um, cover a few, uh, few things. Uh, the first is that this is being recorded and we will make this session available to you on the website um, when it's available. And so we just want to let you know that we are uh, making a recording. Uh, we're talking today about chapter insurance, the most essential uh, insurance coverages that chapters need to have. Um, and we will be... Uh, we will have our uh, speaker, Patrick Cunningham, who is the Association Risk Management Services National Exec for Federated Insurance. He's going to make his presentation and we will ask that you put your questions in uh, the Q&A chat box at the bottom of your screen. Uh, you should see a Q&A at the bottom. You can just put your question into that chat and we will um, cover those questions um, as we go along uh, when we can. Um, so having said that, we'll also have a 10 to 15 minute period at the end of the webinar to um, answer questions that you have uh, for Patrick Cunningham. And um, so feel free to wait until the end as well. I would like to ask everyone to mute um, your microphone during the webinar so that uh, we don't have any exterior external noise um, as the presentation is going forward. Um, and we have about 15 participants as I, I think people will just join in as they um, come through. And so I think we're just gonna go ahead and get started. Uh, I'd like to introduce Patrick Cunningham to you. Uh, Patrick Cunningham is the National Account Executive in the Association Risk Management Services Department at Federated Insurance. He's responsible for managing Federated's National Association and buying group partners. Since 1998, he has spent his entire career working in the marketing areas of Federated Insurance. 
uh, where he was a successful marketing representative, account executive, district marketing manager, and senior marketing representative. He earned the trust of hundreds of business owners in the areas of safety, risk, and business management uh, by focusing on value, service, and relationships. Pat was awarded membership into Federated's Federated's Chairman's Council, Big Hitter Club, Monthly Leadership Council, and Life and Disability Income Contest winner. He also participated in various company focus meetings and workshops, including street talk seminars, uh, risk management academy seminars, and pilot programs. Uh, Patrick is a native of Kansas City, Missouri, and an alum of the University of Central Missouri with a bachelor's in business management. Patrick and his wife are the proud parents of three daughters and two grandchildren. Uh, without further ado, please welcome Patrick Cunningham. Well, thank you, Julie, and good afternoon, SMACNA. What a great day for me. I get a chance to talk uh, my favorite subject, and that's insurance. So uh, I thank each of you for taking time out of your days to join us uh, as we actually share some some hopefully some takeaways for you as you go back to your chapters as it relates to proper insurance programs for them. Um, I, as, as Julie mentioned, I've been at Federated Insurance now for 25 years. And during that time, I spent a, a quite a few years working with local chapters in the Kansas City area of insuring their actual offices. Um, so I do have uh, a few nuggets that I'll try and share with you that I've, 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 I've garnered over the, the, um, the 25 years. Speaking of years, 2014, uh, Federated and SMACNA joined forces and SMACNA named Federated as their exclusive insurance provider for their premier partners program. And since that time, uh, we have just had nothing but tremendous uh, relationships, success for our insured partners, as well as uh, our SMACNA uh, members. And we're very thankful for that. But for, without further ado, I just want to dive into some of the things that we see that will be important for you uh, in your chapters. We'll talk about property. We'll talk about liability insurance. We'll talk about auto insurance briefly. And then we'll talk a little bit about workers' compensation uh, but one thing I definitely want to talk about as we go through this is fiduciary liability uh, for, excuse me, handling of funds and benefits for you for your particular chapters. Uh, and as we go, if, you, if, if a question pops up, if you'll just follow Julie's direction on that. OK, so here we go. So why do you need insurance and why don't we buy insurance today? Um Insurance is designed to help pay for the direct costs of a loss of a claim. Uh, for all of this, this will include medical expenses at any point, indemnity and costs, property damage, and defense costs. What I want to try and do is take all of those and just kind of just water them down and put them in a basic standpoint of how it can help, what you would need to help yourself as a chapter executive as it relates to covering um, the association's property and then uh, the, the liability associated with that. So for insurance, by, uh, by the way, let me stop real quick. We, some of the, the slides that you'll see today will be slides that generally we, we only would show your members, your contractor members. Um, I just wanted to also do, you know, do twofold, show you exactly what your members will be looking for, but more importantly, how it relates to really what happens in the office uh, for the chapter as well. So hopefully we can knock, knock out two, two, you know, both aspects of that, but just stop me along the way if something pops up. But your insurance policy, believe it or not, if you have one for the chapter, it's a contract. It's a contract with your insurance company that provided it. Uh, and in today's market, most insurance companies use what's called ISO forms. ISO is the word ISO that you see on the screen. It stands for Insurance Service Office. And right now there are over 1,800 different types of forms that are available 
for the insurance companies that use ISO forms. Now you add to that at Federated, we're a mutual company, which means that we actually have our own products, we have our own programs, but more importantly, we only represent Federated insurance. We're not tied to any stock companies. Uh, so you know, we, we, we just have our own specialized programs. If you add that we have over 3,300 forms ourselves, and there's a lot of forms, uh, there's a lot of contracts out there in the insurance world. So I'm glad that we're able to just talk to you a little bit about today, about some of those things that matter, um, you know, what you may need. So you have insurance, but are you covered is a question. So let's talk about for your chapter offices right now, do you have property that you own as a chapter? If so, here's some of the things that may uh, make sense for you. If you own the building, you're going to have you're going to need to insure that building properly. And as it relates to insurance aspects, there are a couple of things that you want to look at. You want to make sure that you have a proper value of that building along with the property inside that building as well. We can help at Federated to, ter to help you determine the value of a building by doing our own cost analysis as well. This is what we do for any building that we insure ourselves. From that, you want to make sure if that building is going to be on a replacement cost standpoint that you have the proper endorsements in place to insure for what we're experiencing today, and that's the cost of replacing property has gone up exponentially. And it's mainly due to the cost of inflation for material costs, labor, et cetera. Uh, nothing different than what your contractor members are seeing today. So the biggest thing that we're seeing today's uh, as it relates to building coverage is making sure that the values match the actual insurance limits, okay? With your property coverage, your building is gonna be included with that, but you'll also have any of your office equipment, any of your property that you have within that, that building itself, there's a separate limit that you'll need for that. So again, you've gotta take into consideration the cost of replacing that material or those pieces of equipment, whether it be a scanner, whether it be a, a laptop, whether it be a desk, whether it be the lights, whatever you have within that building that the association owns, you'll need to make sure that it is covered under that property limit as well. Uh, one coverage that most associations may not even think about is if there are certain amounts of income that the association does bring in, uh, even nonprofits as well, there's a coverage called business income coverage. So that coverage you'll see with contractors quite a bit because let's say a natural disaster comes and hits the area that you live in, whether it be a hurricane, whether it be a tornado, et cetera, and it destroys the building, the place of where you're operating or where your members, it destroys one of their premises of where they're operating as a contractor. Um, it will cause them to have suffer some type of financial setback because they may not be able to operate their businesses for an extended period of time. Well, they have employees and those employees still have families that they have to take care of. So our industry has created this coverage called a business income coverage where it will actually simply pay back to our insureds, in your case, a, a, a chapter office, the cost of what it, what it normally would take on a monthly basis to continue your operations. So it's, it's a coverage that's designed for your member contractors, but you may see a need for that in the business, in the chapter offices as well um, to help pay for the payroll while the, the office is not being reconstructed uh, while that, the office is trying to be relocated if it's for an extended period of time. So um, business income is a coverage that also will come into play. Some of your chapters may be, uh, sitting right now, your property, your building, and your contents of the building may be sitting in a flood zone or maybe sitting in a hurricane zone. There's actually special policies designed for those areas. Uh, we, I think all of us, FEMA, uh, the Federal Emergency Management, those folks 
are the ones that actually would sell those policies to you. So if you're in one of those zones and you own your building as a chapter or you have property within a building that you're renting and you're in a flood zone or a hurricane zone, uh, you'll need to go through FEMA or uh, an agency to get that coverage as well. OK, so that's really the, uh, the, 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 the substance of property insurance. I'll talk about in just a second here about if you have property that you take away from the business or from the office and you maybe you have a trade show and you have uh, things that you'll be using at that trade show that you normally store at the building, but now you're out at a hotel or now you're out at a conven convention hall with that equipment. I'll talk about how to cover that here in just a second. Okay. Um, as you see, Inland Marine is the topic of the next slide. And this particular site was designed for your contractor members. As you can see, the, the lift that we have there, you see the words contractor tools and equipment. So whenever your contractor members have their machinery that is inside their business, in their buildings, in their garages, in all of their storage sheds, it's covered under their property coverage, okay? But the moment that it leaves that facility and goes out into the field so they can make uh, to take care of the jobs that they have insured, inland marine coverage then kicks in. OK, I mentioned this because um, trade shows are things that you may be doing with your chapters. Conventions are things that you may be doing with your your chapters. Maybe you have booths. Maybe you have props. Maybe you have tables, chairs. Maybe you have computers that you take out to those events. Once they leave the address, once they leave the office and they go out into the field, so to speak, that's a contractor term, um, then it, you will need the inland marine coverage to cover it, that, that pieces, those pieces of equipment once they leave the premises of operations. Okay. And that's why I included this slide for you, because occasionally uh, your chapters will have property that you need to cover while you leave the, the business operations. All right, we've all heard the words general liability. Um, as a chapter, as a business owner as well, I call this litigation and coverage <laughs> because in, in America today, litigation is a, a fabric of what, uh, of what we see on a day in and day out basis when you're in my industry. Uh, but it's important for you, not just for your contractor members to have general liability coverage, it's important for the chapter as well. And here's why. Um, as a association, uh, you are representing an industry, you're representing a group of members, a group of, of contractors in your case, that rely on your expertise. That's why they've, you know, uh, have, have formed this particular association. Within the association, there's also these volunteers that usually make up a board of director. We're going to talk about something that's called professional liability down the road, but I bring it up here because a lot of chapter execs think that their professional liability coverage is actually included under the general liability policy or the general liability, general liability contract. Unfortunately, it does not. Uh, you have to have a professional liability policy, and we'll dive into that just uh, in a second. But I wanted to talk about a couple of things that your members may ask you about as it relates to your uh, as it relates to insurance. And there's two types of general liability policies um, and, and not general, general liability policies, but there's two types of, of, of coverages that really drive general liability. One is property damage. The other is um, if, if, if someone feels that they have been wronged uh, in some way without property damage, and that's where litigation will come into play. Without property damage, your general liability policy uh, doesn't kick in. So um, we'll talk about some of those other areas where litigation may occur without property damage and how do you, how do you cover that. I'm not going to go deep into it because it's really... Uh, more for your contractors, members, but it will play a role with you as a as a chapter executive in covering in, in covering the actual um, chapter office. 
business errors and emissions um, for a chapter business errors and emissions is not something that you will have really for yourself for the chapter itself but your contractor members will that's why i included this slide business errors and emissions basically takes care of a litigation claim for one of your contractors if something goes wrong with their contract something goes wrong with their performance or something goes wrong with their professional services that's why they'll need business errors and emissions. That's why I included this slide. Another slide that I included that won't specifically relate to the association's chapter office is employment related practices liability. If, if your contractor members have any type of wrongful termination, harassment, discrimination type of incidents, this is the coverage that will kick in. Could this happen for a chapter executive office? Sure, if, if you have employees that are uh, employed by a SMACNA chapter, um, they, they receive their, they make their living as an employee of a SMACNA chapter, this coverage would be needed for the SMACNA chapter as well. Most insurance companies will tell you right up front that this type of coverage is explicitly excluded from a general liability policy. Therefore, as a chapter, you would want to make sure that you purchase an employment related practices liability policy. And I would uh, I would recommend that you look at at least a million dollars in coverage uh, for that type of coverage, uh, because this type of crime is one that litigation is expensive um, and the cost of litigation with attorney de defense, it will generally be covered with the employment related practices policy, at least at Federated, we, we cover it. Can I just jump in really quick here? Um, Patrick, I just wanna mention the importance of this uh, coverage for chapter executives, especially in small companies, like your chapter is small, maybe you have three or four or five employees, uh, this kind of a, a suit might, you know, pit one employee against another, and then it's a he said, she said kind of thing. And it's just very important uh, to have that kind of coverage uh, to protect against that type of a situation um, for a small for a small company, like a small chapter. Sure. Well said, Thank Julia. In, in fact, one thing that I would say um in using the example that she mentioned, pitting one one employee against another employee generally is not going to be where this falls. Generally, it's going to uh, this coverage is generally going to be triggered by an event where someone is harassed potentially by another employee, and I think that's might be where you're going with this, Julie, or they've been terminated from the association. Um, this coverage will protect will protect the 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 um, uh, chapter for that. I had an incident with one of my chapters where two employees got into a verbal argument and went outside and actually it became a physical fight. And the coverage for employment related practices liability was not triggered because the of how it's set up. That actual coverage for federated would be covered under the commercial umbrella uh, as a third party, as a third party um, uh, setup. So sometimes the trigger for this coverage um, isn't just, you know, someone, an individual feeling that they were wrong by the, the chapter. It may be like Julie mentioned, where two employees are ganging up on one other employee, uh, making, you know, rude, crude comments. And unfortunately, today's world, that is that does happen. Uh, but it is a policy that you will need outside of the general liability. That's the reason why I actually included this in here, because it, the coverage, the coverages are not included under your general liability policy. Workers' compensation, um, I'm not going to go too deep into it, but we need to talk about it, because if your chapter does have employees uh, in most states uh, that are not monopolistic, 
uh, will re be required to have workers' compensation. A lot of the things that you see in this particular slide are things that are specifically um, uh, your contractor members will understand. And this slide actually was created to show what a workers' compensation experience mod looked like and how it impacted insurance premiums. Uh, the top shot slide, uh, by the way, an experience mod uh, is set by the insurance company who files it with NCCI, uh, the governing body for worker co workers' compensation in the country. And they start you out at a 1.0 baseline. Anything above that baseline is a debit towards premium costs. Anything below that one point, like in this example, 0.98, uh, is a 2% cr uh, credit applied to the workers' compensation premium. So that kind of gives you an idea of how that works. If you've got a 0.73 experience mod, your premiums are going to be a lot cheaper for that. Uh, most associations, believe it or not, do not even qualify for an experience mod, and it's because the premium amount isn't high enough to generate one for NCCI. That's just the nerd in me talking insurance. Um, Send me, I can, I can go deep into that if, if needed uh, with someone afterwards. But the exp workers' compensation is something as a chapter exec that you may see the need if you have, if you're operating with employees outside of a mo monopolistic state. Precarious liability is a term that some of you may have heard. Um, an employer can be liable for the acts or the emissions of, of its employees, provided it can be shown that they took place in the course of their employment. The biggest thing that you'll see today, I'm going to show you not all of this video on the next slide, but just an example of vicarious liability here. Uh, and then I'll come back and talk about it. Patrick, is there supposed to be sound with this video? Because we are definitely not getting any sound. Thank you for stopping me then. I apologize that I'm hearing the exact same sound and it sounded wonderful on my side. I, I'm so sorry, uh, Julie. I didn't realize that you guys were not hearing the sound. Basically, I'll just do a quick recap. Vicarious liability came into play in this particular scenario in which uh, business owners, uh, employees were involved in accidents while they were using a hands-free device. Uh, the, the businesses would be brought into the litigation from, from any things, any damages that would have occurred from the use of the cell phone, from the driver using the cell phone in the in the accident because they were doing work on the on behalf of that particular employer. So they were brought into the lawsuits. I bring that up in that I know that it's difficult for SMACNA chapters or SMACNA as national to talk a lot about the, the restriction of the use of, health, of cell phones. 
But I just want to, you, as a chapter exec, if you have any employees that are using their own vehicle um, on behalf, to do work on behalf of the chapter, there is liability um, that, that, that you could be held accountable for if they're using the vehicle in an improper way and cause damage to another vehicle or another human being. So um, with most auto liability policies, your, your liability, your vicarious liability coverage will be part of that contract. So that was the purpose of the slide of the video. And I'm, I'm my immense apologies that you could not hear the sound. Sounded no, great on my end. I got, I got to tell you. <laughs> no worries. But that is something chapters should check. You need to make sure your auto policy has coverage here because this is a big area and uh, we've all seen it. And we just need to make sure that you have that coverage um to to make sure that you are completely covered uh in the event of an accident involving uh a cell phone use during during uh when you're driving to a meeting okay and as far as the risk management side of that piece of it even though you may not have a chap a vehicle owned by the chapter that one of the chapter employees uses uh you still want to make sure if some if a chapter employee is going to be driving their own vehicle on behalf of the, the SMACNA chapter, that you know a little bit about who that individual is as it relates to their driving habits. And one way of doing that is just having a simple driving plat policy stating what your expectations are as a chapter uh, for someone doing business on, on, on your behalf in their own vehicle. Uh, you can actually screen their motor vehicle report before you assign them a, a responsibility of driving on behalf of the chapter, but you obviously you have to get the right paperwork signed for those things. So again, federated is, we know this for us is, it uh, is our monster, uh, distracted driving. And we will continue to talk about the ramifications that happen when, uh, you're not doing, when the driver's not doing their due diligence to take care of, um, the, those around us, you know, who are trying to drive safe. Um, so, but vicarious liability is a huge uh, component that would come into play for chapters as well. Um, and the biggest example of that is one of the employees driving a vehicle. Cyber insurance is another topic. Um, if I, I again, I, I mentioned earlier, I've been in the industry for 25 years. I did not see my first cyber claim in the industry or excuse me in, in my area uh it was maybe four years ago was the first time i saw my a, a claim for cyber insurance since that time cyber uh liability cyber liability claims are on the rise they they're happening on a uh daily basis on thus um you know the coverages themselves what is cyber what is cyber uh, security breaches? What? So I think we all have heard of maybe two months ago in Las Vegas, uh, two of the biggest casinos were hacked into, uh, kidnapped, so to speak, by and held for ransom. Um, MGM and and the I can't believe I, I can't believe Caesars. I'm sorry, it was MGM and Caesars, and that was a what. That was a cyber breach where they held all of their data. They, it, it closed. It caused them to close down all of their casinos temporarily because of all of their systems were locked up. Um, that's just a cyber breach. Why would that be important for the chapter or something that breaches? Well, a chapter, a SMACNA chapter has confidential information of some of your members, name, addresses, date of birth, possibly. Um, I don't see a need where you may have social security numbers, but there are times where you may have pertinent information on one of your members. If that, if you are breached, if your data is breached, you now are held responsible for uh, that data that has been compromised by these criminals that are sitting in their living rooms today and just having uh, video game um, crimes that they're taking advantage of data that you are storing. So, Make sure that you talk to your uh, chapter insurance agents about cyber insurance. Uh, again, it is on the rise and these criminals are targeting smaller companies like a chapter office, like a small 
smack the contractor because it's easy access. But the first line of defense is just making sure that you have a proper relationship with someone that can help you with firewalls and security uh, behind the scenes. But cyber insurance is definitely something that we want to look at for chapter offices. I'm just going to jump in really quick, Patrick. I want uh, contractors or I want chapters to sort of think about like, uh, you know, sometimes uh, chapters will host like golf outings and things like that where credit card information uh, is collected. Um, and so if that information is breached, then it would be very, very helpful to have this insurance. The other point on this is um, for chapter executives that are trustees uh, and handle trust information for members uh, in the industry in which you might have social security information and the like. Uh, it is important for the trusts to have this type of insurance as well uh, for uh, making sure that administrators are covered with cyber insurance. Well said, well said. Um, we all think that credit, the credit card companies will back up their credit um, by our, our, the, the actual loss of, of, of a theft uh, from a credit card. They do in most cases. The biggest thing that they don't take care of is the, the, the identity theft that goes along with that, that, that actual violation. So, Cyber insurance will definitely protect the association from any litigation that came back from them, uh, came back to them from something like that. Next slide is pollution. I just wanted to show this. Uh, your members, your contractor members, uh, will have questions as it relates to pollutions for particular jobs. I don't see that that will be an issue for any of our chapters unless you're taking something uh, to. Uh, a convention site that would cause a pollutant event. Uh, and I just don't see that too, too regularly. I leave this in just in case you, any of your contractor members talk about it. Um, we do have coverages, but most of our competitors that, feder that Federated competes against have an ISO policy that explicitly excludes any type of total pollution event. We actually add that coverage into our policies at Federated. Insurance certificates and endorsements. Uh, we talked about trade shows. We talked about conventions that chapters have. Uh, if you can remember before you go in into your contract or, or while you're signing your contract with the hotel or the venue of where you're going to have your event, they may ask you to provide a certificate of insurance. Uh, along with that certificate of insurance, they're asking you to name them as an additional insured. What does all of that mean? Basically, I, I started the, the, the conversation out earlier about your insurance policies are contracts. So at any time that you name that venue as an additional insured on your policy, they are an, actually an insured. They can actually file a claim. Their, your insurance will protect them as well. That's good and that's bad. The good part of it is if you've done something wrong while you're on their premises that caused them harm, you should pay for that. Your insurance should cover that. The challenge is, is that if you're on their property as a, a chapter and something goes wrong on the property while you're there and that you had nothing to do with, the um, additional insured venue owner now can bring your insurance policy into play as well. That's the negative, but the, the positive behind it is if that does happen, uh, you in, with most coverages, which most insurance companies, you have coverage for that. Uh, your contractor members, though, will talk to, will, will have things that are called a general allowed GL ongoing operations, additional insured language, or a GL completed operations, additional insured language, as you see on the screen. And those are very common today. Um, anytime a contractor is working with a general contractor, the GC will always ask for one of those two. One takes care of their operations uh, while they're on the job site. One takes care of the work that your, your SMACNA member may do once they leave the job site. Uh, but that today, most time, most general contract, uh, gen general contractor policy or contracts will require that language. <clears throat> OSHA violations, again, I just put this slide on here to let you know that 
you as a chapter exec could have something like this that could come into play if one of your chapter employees is involved in a serious accident, not necessarily an auto accident, but a serious accident. Um, maybe they're in the office and they're trying to clean the top shelf and the top shelf collapses on them and they are severely injured and are uh, killed. OSHA will come in and, and investigate any type of serious incidents like that. Um, just know that the biggest thing that you want to know that you want to have on hand when it relates to a serious incident like that is some type of risk management program stating the do's and the don'ts that you want to have for any of your chapter employees. Federated Insurance has vendors that we work with, with your contractor members to put together this type of information. We can also help you as a chapter as well with that, with, with providing even a safety manual to put in place. I get it. I know that you don't have contractor members working for the association chapter other than a volunteer basis. However, there are certain employees that you have and you still have a due diligence as an employer to protect them uh, with OSHA guidelines. Disaster planning is a piece that Federated actually uh, really developed through the, the through trial. Um, we had really just kind of fostered uh, relationships with different insureds about trying to take care of a catastrophic situation with them, the do's and don'ts after that. But in 2017, um, we came out with a disaster planning program because it was the deadliest year, the costliest year of disasters. If you can remember back in that 2017 timeframe, we had Hurricane Harvey, we had Hurricane Ar Irma, we had Cur Hurricane Maria, and combined they had, uh, you know, nearly $165 million just from those three alone. Um, billion. I, if I said million, I meant billion. <laughs> uh, 165 billion dollars. So what we have done uh, is we could, we've developed a uh, stay open for business program from a risk management standpoint of here's what you do if you have a hurricane that destroys your chapter office. Here's what you would do if you had a tornado that destroys your chapter office and your employees um, need to know what the next step is. So disaster planning is something that we recommend at Federated um, that you put in place even as a chapter executive because you know, if, if a, even if you're not in a flood or hurricane area, tornadoes or something that are, uh, could cause that same type of catastrophic loss. Okay. Risk management, uh, continuing on with it, workers' compensation in, for your chapter contract, for your, for your members is something that the majority of them are dealing with as an, as a chapter executive, your office may have workers' compensation. Make sure that you're using uh, the managed care programs if they're accessible. What is a managed care program? If someone were injured, um, the biggest in injury that we see in the chapter executive world is something that was related to the, the automotive uh, injuries or carpal tunnel heavy or rep repetitive use of, of joints. But a managed care program is designed to provide workers' compensation benefits to your chapter employees at a discounted uh, way with specific type of care providers, very similar to what you may see with a PPO or an HMO on a group health plan. Um, the other things that you want to, to look at as a chapter exec are the hiring practices. If you have to hire someone to work for your chapters, make sure you have an application. Make sure you have uh, a system in place where you're looking at resumes and reviewing references. Just make sure you do the, your due diligence to potentially, if you can, do criminal background checks. Federated has vendors that we can help you with those things at a considerable um, cost discount. But look at those things. Training, obviously, is going to be, in, in, for most chapter execs, it's going to be on the job, ongoing training. Uh, but the last thing I'll look at on that risk management is motor vehicle records, if someone's going to be driving on behalf of the vehicle, uh, on behalf of the chapter, make sure you know that that person 
uh, has a valid driver's license with a good history of driving and a motor vehicle report can do that. Again, you cannot do that without their consent, but we can help you provide the forms to get their consent for that as well, okay? But there's I'm gonna a lot in to here. do. I'm gonna sure. jump in here really quick and I just wanna remind chapter executives to be consistent with this um, area. So in other words, be consistent with criminal background checks, be consistent with um, obtaining uh, drivers' records, driving records. Be consistent to protect yourself. You can't pick and choose. You need to make sure that you apply it across the board uh, to all employees. That is so true. Um, again, the only time that you're actually going to pick and choose is if you, with the motor vehicle or anything vehicle related. If if someone's job isn't related to that, obviously, um, you know that need is there. But again consistency and that's i'm so glad you used that word julie that is that is the key word with it and risk management is all about that is making sure that you're doing that on a consistent basis with all but we don't think about it from a chapter standpoint that these are some of the things that we might need to look at and they are so we can help you with that if you don't have it in place uh this next slide just talks a little bit about workers compensation if we were looking at it on or, excuse me, not just workers' compensation. It looks at our, what we're looking at, characteristics of a risk as an underwriter. We've got company A, they very few claims, great property, regular fleet maintenance program, formal hiring practices, training, active ongoing safety training. They're looking at their driver's motor vehicle reports or even their employees who drive their own vehicles on behalf. And then there's no nonsense management attitude. I, I like the word no nonsense, meaning, <laughs> but uh, but th these are someone who is engaged. Then you've got company B, who has many claims. They're a rundown property. Their fleets are not maintained. There's no formal hiring practices. There's no minimum. There's minimum safety training, driving standards. There's nothing set. They just talk about it, but don't do anything with it. And then there's indifferent management attitude. Anybody wants to insure company A for all day, all night, and uh, Federate is no, is no different than that. But characteristics of what, what you do as a chapter exec, as it relates to the people that are going to work with you and how the, the, the actual office is run, how the app, uh, actual office with property is maintained, it does factor into your insurance company's underwriting guidelines and how they view you. Premium is definitely impacted by it. Take ownership. Um, we do at Federated a major client service review with all of our contracted members where each year we sit down with them and we talk about their insurance contract with us, the coverages, we review the limits, we review all of those ancillary, uh, ancillary things like pro professional liability, uh, which Again, let's let's remember that's something that we want to look at as a chapter exec. Basically, what professional liability provides is, is that if you have a board of directors, all volunteered members uh, that are making decisions on behalf of your chapter, on behalf of SMACNA, and one of your SMACNA members is in disagreement with it and finds that it is a violation of maybe their human rights, so to speak, and they file litigation, Without a professional liability policy, there's nothing there to protect those volunteer members who's just spent their time. So we need to make sure that each of your chapters are uh, have the, pro the proper professional liability coverage in, in place. But don't get caught in the apples, the apples game when you're looking at your policy. It's easy to do as a chapter exec because your funds are limited in a lot of ways. Um, don't just always look at the cheapest uh, program make sure that they're having the proper coverages in place. And we try to give you some examples of those there. Uh, but the last thing is just review your contracts before you're signing them because your insurance policy is a contract. And once you pay that premium, um, that, that policy, that's what the language is going to set. That's how the language was going to be applied at time of loss. And in most cases, you don't even know what that contract is other than the, the date it renews and the premium that they're asking you to pay for it. So make sure you do your due diligence to, to look at that. So hopefully some of these, I mean, I high stepped through quite a bit of those. Julie and I just determined that at the end, if there were some questions that 
came into play that we can re revisit those or even if there are some topics that maybe we didn't hit on that we would like to, to, to take a look at. Um, but I'll turn that over to that right now, Julie, if you would like. I would love for you to talk about directors and officers liability. Um, you know, in chapter insurance against mismanagement. Um, I, I just, uh, I don't know what you might have there that you could recommend for our chapters, but I think that that's important for, um, uh, you know, for our chapters in uh, their officers play various roles in the chapter. And um, I just, I think that that's a really important piece. You could touch on you that bet. for just a minute. I'd appreciate it. Sure. So, and, and, and in my industry, the insurance industry, not every carrier provides that directors and officers professional liability coverage or that fiduciary liability coverage. What are the two? Uh, the professional directors, officers uh, coverage is designed to protect all of those members who are involved in decisions for the chapters, board of directors in most cases. And it, it will protect them from a litigation standpoint if the decisions that they make on behalf of the chapter are challenged in a court of law by anyone. Um, so, you know, we all go home at night and when we go at home at night, we think we're done with our, our day. Well, all those decisions that we've made either as a business owner or as a volunteer board member can be challenged by anyone. And so it's important that, to make sure that each of your chapters has that those directors and officers coverage, covered with their professional liability policy. And then along the same lines, anyone that is handling any funds, any trust, any uh, financial type of documents on behalf of the chapters, on behalf of the association, there's a coverage called fiduciary liability coverage that needs to come into play. And most insurance carriers will not have those particular coverages uh, because they're totally separate from the general liability policy. They're or what we call an ancillary policy. So make sure that you have coverage for that in the event that, again, you are challenged on your role of handling those type of transactions. Um, so it's very important that, you know, you utilize our industry to provide those type of protections. And unfortunately, we don't do a good enough job as an industry to even bring those into the forefront with you. Right. At Federated, we try our darnest to do that on an annual basis during our annual client review with all of our um, contractor members. Yeah, I, I thank you so much for touching on that. I would also say, I'm just gonna add to that, if chapter executives, you are serving as administrators, you must have fiduciary liability insurance. Um, and anybody handling any kind of funds should be bonded. Um, you really need to have those protections in place. You just don't know. Um, and it's it's critical to have fiduciary liability and bonding for people who um, work with uh, money funds on behalf of your chapter, on behalf of an, uh, a, a joint fund uh, or a welfare fund, a health and welfare fund or a pension fund. Um, <clears throat> go ahead, Patrick. I was just going to say, and, and really with the bonding uh, piece of it, it is not an expensive coverage to add to your policy. Um, and most carriers simply just don't check a box in a lot of cases to add it. It's a coverage that can be added under what's called a crime coverage, crime policy. Um, you know, and, and so it's, Julie, you, you've hit it on the head. Anyone that has any of those type of responsibilities, uh, we can help provide that protection for you very simply from our industry. One other thing I wanna mention, and then we've got two questions here in the Q&A, but I would also, uh, Patrick, ask you to talk a little bit about travel accident insurance for chapter executives. A lot of our chapter executives travel um, across the state, uh, travel to local meetings, travel three or four hours away to regional conferences. And so can you touch a little bit on the importance of travel accident insurance? 
Sure, we can. You know, and thank you for bringing that one up too. Actually, you and I talked about that the other day as we as we relate to that. My apologies for not bringing it up. Most chapters, when they think of travel insurance, um, I think it's it's not what they think it is. Travel insurance, for the most part, is. Uh, what you see most commonly is you see it when you're purchasing something, either whether it be online with a website or if you're doing it through a travel agency. Hey, check the box if you'd like to insure that particular airfare that you just purchased or that particular hotel that you just booked in the event that you can't make the make the trip due to whatever that that issue is. That's continue to do that if you see the need for that as a chapter, because that's money that you would be out of if you're not able to do that. However, as it relates to our industry with travel insurance, believe it or not, Julie, most of the time travel insurance is only purchased when someone is traveling outside of the United States uh, because of the financial issues that are involved with that. But more importantly, when you purchase that type of travel insurance, when you're leaving the, the country, there's all of these um, ancillary coverages that are added to it. For example, if you're in a foreign country and you need to have contact with the U.S. Embassy because of whatever the case may be, the travel insurance for that, it comes into play. Um, but so from a travel insurance standpoint for, for local chapter executives, there's not a lot there for you as you're going interstate. Um, so anytime that you, if you see a need, most of your, um, airline companies, hotels, uh, travel agencies will can't provide protection for you from that standpoint. So if there's something else that you thought you might wanted to go down there with that, Julie, just let me know that I can touch on that as well. I think we're good. Um, we've got two questions in the chat here. Um, and one of this is a probably very, just incredibly relevant um, is there insurance for a chapter office that is now moved to a home office? Is there anything separate that should be considered when a chapter uh, a chapter office used to be in a different location and is now in a home office? That's an excellent question uh, because we see that in a lot of cases with non non for profits. Just about everything that we talked about today still will relate to that office that is office from home, other than the actual coverage for the building, so, so to speak. Make sure that in that scenario that you reach out to that homeowner's insurance company to make sure they will allow for their policy contract to cover the operations of a business, so to speak, in your chapter. Uh, so that's the biggest thing you want to make sure is that your homeowners still would provide any type of property coverage for the chapter's uh, property while it's in your home. Uh, if not, then, you know, you can still, I st your, some of your contractor members are, might be small enough, believe it or not, that they operate out of their home. Federated insures those contractors just as well. Uh, the only thing that is absent is in most cases, is just the property for the building, the property coverage for the building. And is that pretty easy to add? So, for example, if a homeowner's insurance policy does not cover business operations within a home, is it fairly easy to simply add that um, as a as a you know an add on rider or something along those lines uh, for the chapter insurance? Yeah, it, that, that's a great question. It, it's fairly easy. Is not. Nothing in our industry for, for whatever reason is fairly easy, but it, it, it is a simple uh, task of actually adding an address that is location, you know, out at someone's home. We just add that as a for, as that particular location. All of the liability coverages that we had for the chapter just follow that as well. So it, it's very easy in that regards. You're just adding that as a location for the chapter. And but but again, the biggest thing, though, is making sure that the homeowners coverage will still override or still sit on top of everything that's taking place in the home, uh, because a lot of personal lines carriers may not want you operating a business from your home. OK, good to know. That's a great question, Lori. Thanks for asking that. Um, we've got another question here. If a chapter executive is renting a car for a SMACNA event. 
should the chapter executive purchase the rental car insurance through the rental car company? It, that's a that's a wonderful question. It's one that I feel that quite a bit just with talk, just talking with contractor owners for, uh, in general. In most cases, if your personal insurance policy, auto insurance policy, uh, provides a drive other car type of coverage, then you're okay. You wouldn't need to do that through the Hertz rentals, the national rentals, the, any of those car rental companies. So it's important that you check with your personal insurance carrier on that vehicle if it would provide drive other car coverage for that particular driver. Um, but in most cases, uh, if they don't have it, it can easily be added with by adding that particular uh, endorsement coverage. For to add it to your auto insurance than to buy the Hertz coverage. You, I, I did not hear the first part of that. I My headset broke up there. Jill, uh, repeat that, please. So it, it would probably be cheaper to add that to your insurance coverage with your car insurance carrier than to purchase the Hertz insurance at the rental company. It really depends. That's a great question. It really depends on how often you are renting a vehicle uh, for, for, for on behalf of the business. There's nothing wrong with checking uh, or, or purchasing the coverage from the rental car companies as much as we think is that that, it, 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 that it's a big ripoff. It, there's nothing wrong with it. The big challenge is, is that the most personalized car carriers will cover you while you are renting a vehicle. The challenge personally, that's as personal. If you're going on a family vacation and let's say you're insured with XYZ company for your personal autos, in most cases, it will cover you while you're renting that vehicle from the rental company. The challenge becomes when you start renting a vehicle on behalf of the SMACNA chapter, now it's a business rental. You got to make sure that that uh, commercial policy that with your insurance carrier does cover you. And at Federated, it's an easy process of just checking a box of and 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 you're covered from that standpoint, as long as you're renting on behalf of doing business um, for SMAC, for that SMACNA chapter, if we insure it, obviously. Wonderful. Thank you for that. I, I always, that's a, that was a great question too, because that's like a personal question too, when we go on vacation, when we do whatever. Um, I, I always get to the counter and I'm like, oh, I don't know. I don't know what to do. Right. <laughs> right. Well, it, uh, just before you leave, just check with most just personal lines it. carriers. It will exactly. cover you and you wouldn't need you would not need that coverage. I travel quite a bit with Federated. I never yeah. take the waivers with the rental companies because it's covered there. So but I <clears throat> excuse me. I also sound like that attorney, though. Well, it depends. You know, well, it, in this scenario, <laughs> yeah. it depends on if it's personal or business. That's that's the biggest deciding factor. Cool. Wonderful. All right. That I don't have any other questions. I, I, I if anybody would let's just open it up to questions. If anybody, uh, if any participants would like to ask questions, um, just jump out there and um, we'll try not to talk over one another. Uh, so if that happens, we'll 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 figure out a system. Maybe the raise hand uh, little symbol here. We can use that if needed. But um, if if there are, let's just open it up and see who else has questions. Sounds good. Does anybody else have any questions for Patrick Cunningham about insurance coverage? This is your ch chance to ask. You don't have to put it in the chat. Just unmute and ask the question. Uh, 
Ah, okay. Someone just informed me that they can't, that they're muted. All right. Uh, unmuting, not an option. Okay. If you have a question, put it in the chat. I've got it, or in the q and I've got it open. All right, how to find out about a local federated agent. Um, Patrick, would you like to share some information there for our chapter executives? You betcha. And thank you for that question, Lori. Um, you can actually easily access any of our agents by just going to uh, federatedinsurance.com and locate your marketing rep at the top of our website is, is there. There's actually a link on the SMACNA National to our website as well. So it's very, make it pretty easy. You just type, once you get to that piece of it, you just type in a zip code and we'll pull up that marketing representative in your area. Awesome. And we'll make sure you've got that information. Uh, we'll make sure we get that link out as well. Uh, sure. Let's see. If we have any other questions here. You know what? I, I hopefully she can hear us. I didn't. I didn't think about it. We could. She, she could hear us. <laughs> oh, I missed you too, Stacy. <laughs> <laughs> and by the way, everyone, she, I, I'm biased. She's the best <laughs> Magna chapter executive in, in the country. So <laughs> she's awesome. She's another person. If you have any questions, if you are a new chapter executive, Stacy is the person to go to. She's awesome. We love her. And um, we really appreciate her uh, in our industry. Yeah. Sorry, we won't let you talk. <laughs> <laughs> hey, that's Julie's rule. <laughs> I don't know. I didn't, I didn't set this up. I'm just going to claim. I just have to say, I didn't set it up. I'd let you talk. <laughs> all right any other questions for patrick cunningham all right i'm gonna we're gonna end it here thank you so much patrick i really appreciate um your willingness to share your expertise uh, we'll make sure that the chapters get information about uh, federated insurance and how to find a rep. Um, and if anybody has any questions later on that they want to ask, I'm happy to share them with Patrick. Just send me uh, an email. It's jmarnell at smacna.org. And we'll make sure that he uh, gets your question and answers it uh, for you. I want to thank the chapter executives for uh, for uh, attending today and listening. We hope um, we hope this has been helpful and uh, give us some feedback. Send me an email if you liked it, and um, we'd love to we'd love to hear your feedback. So thank you so much, Patrick. We really appreciate it, and uh, wish you all a wonderful rest of your day. Thank you, Julie, and thank you all of the chapter execs. We appreciate you. Thank you.